Thank you everyone for uh, joining us today. So today we're, uh, we have uh, Melanie Revilla, who you probably all know is an expert in survey methodology and is just joining us uh, at eBay since October, correct? Uh, for the ERC funded starter grant, web data. And you're gonna tell us a little bit about, well, not a little bit, but a lot about <laughs> new opportunities for uh, using big data in survey methodology as a complement. So I don't want to take up too much of my time uh, and I'll give the floor to you. Thank you very much, Melanie, for, for sharing this with us. Thank you very much. So yes, I'm going to present something that is related with this CRC starting grant and the topic is new opportunities to enhance or replace conventional web uh, survey data. So first uh, question is which opportunities are we speaking about? And these opportunities, they are actually mainly linked to the growing presence of smartphones. So smartphones are really everywhere for already a few years. It actually seems that there are more people having smartphones than toilet worldwide. And this, of course, affected also the participation in web surveys. So around 10 years ago, even if it was not planned by the researchers, people just started participating in the web survey using their smartphones. And this created actually some challenges for the researchers as well as some opportunities. So it created really different kinds of opportunities, but uh, my focus is on the fact that if you have smartphones, these devices, they have sensors, they have microphone, camera, GPS inserted in them. So you can collect new kind of data beyond the conventional survey questions. And also the fact that you can install app easily on smartphone makes it also possible to collect other kinds of data. So there are actually uh, different kinds of this data and they all have potential benefits and risk. So when I decided to apply for the ERC and try to define the project, I thought it would be important to look at more than one of these data types because they have a lot in common, but also to look at them separately because each of them really has some specificities. No? So the idea was that we could uh, look at different types of data and I proposed to focus on four of them that I thought would be ones that would have like a uh, very good potential. So the first one are called uh, metadata and uh, they are called so because they are obtained through a meta that is basically a tracking application that is installed by the participants on the device they use to go online. So it can be smartphones but also PC, tablets. So what this kind of tracker is uh, giving you is at least the list of the URLs that people are visiting online but normally you also get information about the use of app and the time they spend on each web page. So with this information, you can study online behaviors of people by looking at what they are doing instead of asking them to report about what they did online. I'm interested in the metadata by themselves, which means that from a methodological point of view, we are doing research to try to learn more about this kind of data. And that's the part I will develop a bit more later, so I'm not going to say more right now. But I'm also interested in metadata as a potential trigger for in-the-moment surveys. So we call in-the-moment surveys, surveys that are done just after an event of interest to the researcher occurs. So for instance, in the case of the metadata, we can detect that people visit a web page of interest, which can be that they visited the web page of a newspaper, or it could be that they bought a product online. So this kind of event we can detect and when it is the event of interest, we immediately send a survey about this event. So the idea of this in the moment surveys is that by reducing the time you have between the event and the reporting about the event, you can actually get data of better quality, mainly because of the limitation of human memory. So very often what conventional surveys are doing is asking you in the last three months, did you do that? And then asking information about that, but people do not recall well. So we try to reduce the gap between the survey and the event of interest. And because I thought that these in the moment surveys were interesting, not only for online behaviors, but also for things that are done offline. I'm also interested in in the moment surveys that are triggered by geolocation data. 
So in that case, the GPS coordinate of where people are going. So it can be, for instance, that people visit an hospital, you detect that and you want to send a survey about the experience they had in the hospital. Or it could be that people are visiting a natural park and you want to know about why they went there, or what they did there, etc. So the triggering event is a location that has been visited by the person that is tracked uh, using the geolocation data. Besides these two types of data, uh, I'm also interested in visual data and in that case it includes uh, different uh, potential kinds of data. So it can be that you ask people to share, for instance, screenshots of things that they could uh, screenshot on their devices of interest. It can be also that during the survey you ask people to take pictures of videos of things. So for instance, we have asked people to send pictures of themselves, like a selfie, so we could analyze uh, the, the respondents. We have also asked people to send pictures of what they see at the moment that they are answering the survey to analyze the context in which people are answering the survey. And you can also think about tasks like asking people to take pictures of different things in their house or in their workplace to study the condition in which they are working or what they have at home, etc. And it also includes the files that they already have on their phone or on their PCs or that are accessible from these devices. So it's not only that they should do or take uh, the pictures during the survey, but they could also share information that they already took pictures about uh, before. So for instance, we asked people to share pictures of their last holidays to study things about what they did during the last holidays. And finally, the four types of data of interest for this project are voice data. And in that case, we have also two options. So people may dictate, so they speak, but what they say is immediately transcribed into a text and the people can see the text, they can edit the text by typing, and then this text is what is shared with the researchers. Or we have the option of voice recording. So in that case, people are speaking and their voice is recorded and what is shared with the researcher is immediately the voice. So the dictation has some advantages in terms of data privacy, for instance. You do not share the voice but just the text, so it's more similar to a classical open questions. But the voice recording also has other advantages. In particular, you can get information from the tone of voice, so you can try to deduce, for instance, the feelings of the people when they are answering a specific question or their interest in the participating the survey or things about the ethnic origins or the accent people have, so where are they from in a country, etc. by listening to the voice. Okay? So all these four types of data, uh, they have been thought at the beginning because of this growing presence of smartphones, but at the end it's important to say that the research is not limited to smartphones because metadata, I told it, it can also be collected from PCs, the voice data, the visual data, they can also be shared for pieces. So actually the research started by the idea that the growing presence of smartphones allows these new types of data, but it ended up being much more general and we are looking also at pieces participants. So all these uh, new kinds of data, uh, even if they are new, they have already been used also in substantive research. So there is already research about the different uh, kind of data, for instance the metadata, they have been used quite a lot to look at fake news conception, so things like the time that people spend online, and the voice data has been used for instance to look at the level of literacy of the respondent by asking them to read loud some text. So there is already research that is using this data, but this research normally is not looking from a methodological point of view of this data. So they are not considering the different types of errors that this data have or the new challenges that are created by this data. So the idea of the ERC grant is well to do methodological research about this data and really think about how this data could help improving the results compared to conventional survey by replacing some questions or by providing even new insights that we cannot get from what we normally do in conventional web surveys. Okay? So how this uh, data could help? Well, first it's important to say that we are not expecting this data to help and replace all the questions that are asked usually with conventional surveys. So sometimes people started speaking about the end of survey. In my perspective, all these new kinds of data 
are not leading to the end of survey at all. So surveys have still long days, I think, because this kind of data, they can be used for some concept, but not all the concepts that are normally measured using survey questions. No? But still, I think there are enough concepts in which we could replace or complement the data we get from surveys with the new types of data, such that it makes it worth it to look at it. No? So we do expect benefits uh, for some concept, and we expect these benefits both for the researchers and for the participants. So let's start with uh, the researcher side. On the researcher side, where we mainly expect benefit, it's in reducing some of the measurement errors that we know we have when we use conventional survey data. So for instance, a few months ago, actually, as a panelist from an opt-in panel, I was asked the question about how much time do you spend on an average day in WhatsApp? And these are the kind of questions where respondents actually don't know. These are the kinds of activity where you go in and out many times and each time you are not looking how much time you are spending there. So doing an estimate of how much time you spend on WhatsApp on an average way day, weekday is something that is really, really complicated. So we expect large measurement errors there. And on the contrary, if we have a meta instant on the device where your WhatsApp is installed, we could get information about each time that you get in and out. So it seems that this is something that could quite easily be measured using, for instance, metadata, and that this should reduce measurement errors. No? We also expect advantages in terms of measurement errors, for instance, for all the questions where we do expect social desirability. So it's quite easy to lie in a survey when you expect uh, to have a topic that is sensitive and that people want to present themselves in what they think is a more positive way. No? So if you ask in a survey, are you visiting adult websites, people tend to under-report such behaviors. If you ask on the contrary, are you doing sport, people tend to over-report such behaviors. Well, if you are using, uh, for instance, the meta again, to track what people are doing online, you can see if people are visiting adult websites or not. And if people do not want you to know, they really have to change their behaviors. They have to think before doing it, oh no, I have a meta instance, so I'm not going to use this device, I'm going to switch to another device such that they cannot observe it. Which means a big effort each time you want to do such behaviors to lie to researchers. So in particular, when you use the metadata on a device like a PC, it's quite actually common to find visits to such website, and it's much more difficult that people will hide information from you. No? So we do expect uh, that we will have improvements in measurement errors for all different reasons, like uh, not having recall issues or having less bias in terms of social desirability. Besides that, we also expect that with these new uh, kinds of data, we will get a larger amount of data. So this is really clear for the metadata. We get the URL with the timestamp maybe every second when people are opening an, uh, a lot of, of websites uh, in a row. But it's also true, for instance, for images. So the famous adage says it, no, a picture is worth a thousand words. And it's also true for voice data. So in the case of voice data, we expect people to provide longer answer, to provide more information, because speaking is much quicker than typing in. And besides, we expect all this additional information that can be extracted from the voice, like I said before, for instance, the feelings when you're answering, that you will not get with conventional survey data. Another uh, benefit that we have in the case of passively collected data, so GPS metadata that are collected passively, these data, they are real time and they are continuously collected. So you get information really hour per hour and you can therefore answer research questions about the evolutions of some behaviors in a granular way that you cannot get if you are using surveys. So for instance, if you use metadata, you can really look at the evolution of such term, so which kind of terms people are searching on the internet, and you can relate that with big events happening. So because these data are continuously collected, when the pandemic started or when the war in Ukraine started, you could see actually how the search term changed day after day or hour after hour when these kind of events 
just started, which is something that you could not do with Chauvet because you didn't plan the crisis before, so you didn't plan a data collection. It would be really a good, huge luck that you just started doing survey before and you could look at that. And besides, you will never be able to look so many days in the evolution or even for years, but day by day. No? So this really allows to answer research questions that you could not answer with conventional data. In addition, we also expect benefits for the participants. So in particular, if it's passively collected, the time dedicated to provide the information is really low. At the beginning, they have to set up uh, something, so the tracking application, but then they don't have to, to do anything. No? And this means that the level of effort is also really, really low. But again, this is not just for the passive data. Also, if we think, for instance, about the visual data, we do expect that the effort might be reduced depending on the task. You know, for instance, there is research that is interested in knowing what people have in their fridge or all the foods that they have at home to relate that with some kind of uh, what is the diet of people and therefore which kind of uh, health issues might be related to different types of diets. If you want to get this information in a conventional survey, you will probably ask people to type in all the products, all the food products they have at home, which would be really a lot of effort and time consuming for people. Instead, you can just ask them to share some pictures. And this is in that case, in that example, at least much quicker. This is not always the case. No, it depends what is the, the task you will have in the conventional surveys. But in a case like that, you would expect a reduced time and effort. And at the end, uh, if you have reduced time and effort, you can also expect that it will be more enjoyable for the participants. Also because these kind of uh, new types of data, they are actually things that people are really using in their daily life. So here, for instance, you can see the number of photos that I taken each year and you can see that it's really increasing, except during the pandemic that it went a little bit down. And in the last year, there were 1.7 trillion photos taken. And if you consider that you would take one photo per second, it would actually take more than 31,700 years to take one trillion photos. So to just give you an idea of how many photos are there. And people are just not taking pictures, they are also sharing pictures. So if you uh, look in WhatsApp, each day there are 6.9 billion images that are shared. So taking pictures and sharing pictures is really part of the day life of everybody. And actually, I was quite surprised when I found these numbers to see that in Europe, we are the worst in taking pictures, which means that in Africa, they took twice as much pictures per day than in Europe. And in the US, it was even, let's say, much, much more, I think four, four times more. So even here, I thought we take a lot of pictures, but it seems it's the place where we take less pictures. So all this is part of daily life of everybody, which means that it's a natural way to answering, which could make it more enjoyable. No? So this is what uh, people already uh, listed as potential benefits for this kind of data already some years ago. So when I started applying to the ERC, which was like four years ago, there were already a lot of people mentioning that there might be benefits for this kind of data, but no research to prove that there are benefits for this kind of data and also not much research looking at the potential problems. So I first thought, okay, it might be good, but it seems that it might also not be that easy. And there are also challenges that we should think about and that we should balance with the potential benefits if we want to really decide if it's worth using such data. So in terms of challenges, uh, I could thought about several of them. Many of them actually are challenges that we have now because the data are new, but we expect that they will mm, be reduced at least uh, very much in the future if people would get used to this data. So these are kind of challenges that we have at the beginning but should disappear. No? These are, for instance, the fact that you need to have specific tool to collect the data, so you cannot just program a web survey in the way you usually do it. If you want to have voice data or visual data included, you need additional programming to uh, make that possible. However, um, while well, we have been working also uh, within the ERC uh, grant to try to provide some tools, so now there are some codes that you can include in your survey that will help you making it possible to collect this kind of data. 
and those are people who are also working in that direction, so the problem of the tool will be less and less for sure in the future. You also need sometimes new skills for the analysis, in particular for the metadata, so these are really big data, now we have a huge amount of data coming in and you need to know how to analyze such data, but again, this is because we were used to survey, but these are skills that we can learn and then have as we have the skills for the survey. Other problems that we have at this day is that normally it's more expensive if you want to collect such data, both because uh, you depend on private companies very often and because you may need higher incentives if you want people to participate in such tasks. So there are two ways where it could end up being more expensive. The dependence on private companies depend quite a lot the kind of data you are interested in, but for the metadata, this is really a problem nowadays. So all this, I expect them to get better in the future. Now the ones that are down in the list, uh, I'm not sure they will get better in the future, so we have a potential extra selection bias in who participate, which is not new because we already have a selection bias if we do a survey, we have a Selection bias if we do a web survey, because some people do not have still access to web, but we get an extra selection bias potentially if we want people to do other things than just conventional surveys. We also have new types of errors, and this is really an issue we have been working on, and we'll explain a little bit more later for the metadata. And finally, we have also more ethical and data protection issues. Again, this is not new, we have already these problems when we are using conventional web survey data, but the problems are much, much bigger when we think about the new types of data, because it's very difficult to make sure that you get really informed consent. So, for instance, people that are sharing the metadata in NetQuest, which is the main panel in Spain that is doing this kind of data collection, I'm pretty sure that many people agreeing to do it do not realize what they share exactly, because we did some survey asking them about the fact that they had the meta install and some of them said, no, we don't, and they have it, so they do not really realize what it is and what they do, no? So it's very difficult to obtain an informed consent. It's also very difficult, for instance, for images or voice to make sure that people realize everything they are sharing. So if you share a photo of your living room, it might be that there are pictures of your kids somewhere and you didn't realize that, so you are sharing a picture of your kid without really wanting to, just because you didn't thought that on the side it could be there. No? So it's much more difficult, again, to control for the participants what they are sharing, which is then one of the issues I had on the participant side, so you have a loss of control of what you are sharing, it's difficult to make sure to really mm, everything you are sharing, so it can also generate extra privacy issues and also on the participant side you may need extra skills. You need, for instance, to install an application or you need to be able to do a screenshot, to share it, etc. So uh, we see already that things are, are not so easy and that we really have both potential benefits and potential disadvantages. Now the goal of this kind of research we are doing would be to answer questions such that are these benefits higher than the potential disadvantages, taking into account both the participants and the researcher side. Unfortunately, so far there is clearly not enough research yet to answer such questions, no? so that's the way we try to go, but so far nobody has the answer to such questions. And actually, in a general way, so formulated like here, nobody will never have the answer because it's much more specific, so we will need to say if I want to measure this concept of interest and I want to use this kind of data and I'm using the data in this way and my population of interest is this one, then I can try to answer I, there are more benefits than risk or than problems if I'm using this data in that way, etc. to measure that. No? So that's the kind of things we would like to be able to, to answer at the end, let's say, of the project, but I think we will need more research than just this project no, for answering these kind of questions. But what we try to do is uh, do some research that provide empirical evidence and also theoretical frameworks such that we can think about these issues and accumulate some knowledge that at the end we can try to answer these kind of questions.
So I said that we're interested in four types of data, but I will explain a bit more what we did about what, uh, one of them for today, which is the case of the metadata. So I focus on the metadata because I think that's one of the kind of data that really generated a lot of interest in the recent years. So there are already more than 70 papers that are published that are using metadata. And there are even more papers if we think that metadata is part of the larger categories of digital trace data. So there are also people that are not using a method to track what people are doing online, but they are asking, for instance, for data donations. So they ask people within a survey, would you accept to share the historial of what you did online? People can download this historial and they can share that. So that's all the literature that is about digital trace data and methods data is kind of part of that. No? So there is quite a lot of, of interest in this kind of data. And all the research that is using the metadata or the digital trace data in general, they are assuming that the measures that they get from this data are perfect. So they are completely ignoring that you have errors also in this kind of data. And actually there are many papers like this one that consider that the metadata is the gold standard so they use what they get from the metadata to assess the bias in self-measurement. So it means if there is a difference between what people report and what they observe with the meta, they consider that this difference is error in self-reporting. But this is only true if the measure based on the metadata is really the true measure. So we thought that this is not the case and that's why we started doing uh, research on that because many people seem to think that using metadata to measure things is really straightforward, but the reality is that it's actually really, really complicated and even more than what we thought when we started with that. So what we did is try to uh, use the knowledge we have from surveys because we are survey methodologists at the beginning, so we have knowledge really about survey errors, a lot of it, and we try to use this knowledge to adapt it to metadata. So we started with the very famous uh, total survey error and we try to adapt it to metadata. And actually this is a work that is done with Oriol Bosch that is at the London School of Economics but is also part of the project and he is the main uh, leader on this uh, part of the project. So uh, this fra framework um, provides an overview of all the possible errors and the potential causes behind this kind of errors that you get when you work with metadata. And here is actually just a small part of all the possible errors and you see that I could not fit more on the screen so that you can still read, but there are more than that. And I will not go through all of them, that would really be too long. But I just want to emphasize a few potential causes of why we have errors with this data. The first big problem is that people consider the metadata as a gold measure to measure things like the time people spend online. But people normally, they do not install the meter on all the devices they use to go online. Maybe they install it just on the phone or just on the PC at home and maybe two of them but still they have a tablet where it is not installed or they use the computer like me now, another computer that is not their own to go online. So we normally do not observe everything they are doing. So as soon as you try to compute behaviors that are about time, you may have big errors because you are not observing everything. And we also have the opposite problem, which is that people are sharing devices. It's not so true for the smartphones, but it's very much the case for tablets and PCs. So it means that what I observe is not only about the person that is part of my sample, but it might be the wife, the husband, the children, the parents, whoever is living in the household and also has access to this device. So when I compute the time, for instance, the time that this person that is in my sample is spending on Facebook, maybe I actually sum up the time of this person and his mother, his father and everybody that is living in the family. So both of them could actually compensate if we are lucky, but of course we have big errors in both directions and it would be a lot of luck if they compensate. We also have a lot of technology limitations in the meters. So actually it's not just one meter, it's many different meters that are used nowadays 
and we have been working mainly with the one that Wakupa is providing, which is the ones that is most common in the panels that exist nowadays. But depending if the device is iOS or Android, if it is a PC or smartphones, it's actually a different things that you need to do to track the behaviors of people. And at the beginning, when I started working like six or seven years ago on that topic, collaborating with NetQuest, they uh, didn't tell me that they had this technology limitation. So we had to go on and discuss with them during months and years such that we can get a clear idea of what the meta is really tracking and what not. For instance, if you use iOS, if someone uses iOS, we cannot track what they do in the apps. So that's a big technology limitation that should be very clear when they sell metadata to clients, but it's not. And so most of the research, as I said, is completely ignoring these problems. Extraction errors or also transformation errors also have been very problematic in what we have been doing because if you depend on a company that has a method panel, which is most of the time the case, no? because you want people to answer survey and share method data in a continuous way, which means that normally as a researcher, you don't have fundings to do such a data collection by yourself. It would be really too much a field work, no? So you go through a field work company that has method panels, so they have people that all the time are sharing this metadata and are answering surveys. And you buy them part of this metadata. You say, I'm interested in the data from this week for this part of the participant, and they will sell that to you. But it means that they have to extract the data for you. And I think Oriol would uh, would know a bit more, but he's uh, speaking with them maybe for six months or something like that in our last project and the data is still not extracted in really the proper way. He still finds mistake each time he tries to analyze the data again. So that's really a huge problem so far. So first we developed this uh, with framework of errors and then we thought, okay, that's nice. Now we see that there are many potential errors but we would like to know a bit more about the size of the different errors. So we used uh, actually data from the Triple project, which is a project led by Mariano Tolkal at UPF, but involves a lot of different universities. And in this project, we had three survey waves and metadata for the two weeks before and after each wave. So we could uh, actually use this data by combining information from the survey and from the metadata to look at the size of, of some of the potential errors we had identified in the framework. And we focused first on the idea of tracking under coverage. So we decided that people are not installing the meter in all the devices and or all the browsers that they use to go online, because this is one of these technology limitations that we learned on the way and not at the beginning, that you need to install the meter not just for a device in general, but you need to install it for a specific browser. So if I use several browsers to go online and I install the meta only in one of them, I will not get the information from all the others. And it's not something that the company also is really insisting on when people are installing the meta. They are trying to incite people to install it on several devices, but within one device, they are not telling you that you should install it on all the browsers. So what is the result? Well, it is that 80 to 85% of participants are undercovered at least in one of the, of the browsers that they are using to go online. Okay? So this is a huge problem, of course, because you cannot then say that you can compute the time they spend or whatever kind of behaviors, online behaviors of interest, when you are missing such a part of uh, what they are doing online. And of course, this is affecting the final estimate. So in that case, what we did were some simulations from the people that are fully covered. We tried to see if they would not be fully covered, what would happen, and we saw that this is affecting, as we expected, the estimates, both univariates and multivariate ones. Then we also worked on uh, the validity of the measure. Again, we came from survey methodology. So in surveys, when you want to measure something, you start with the concept, and you try to operationalize this concept into survey questions. And it's very clear for survey methodologies that the concept is different from the measure and that we would like the link to be perfect, but that it's never the case. <coughs> so we really clearly distinguish in survey 
concepts from questions. The problem is that when people started using big data in general or new types of data, it seems they completely forgot about what they learned from surveys. So they are starting with, I'm measuring the total time spent online, but they are not explaining, for instance, how they operationalize that. But when you want to measure the total time spent online, or in that case, we focused on the one that is about online news media exposure, because this is the one that was most used in these papers that have been already published about metadata. Well, you need to make a lot of decisions. For instance, what do you consider to be news? So you can say, okay, if it is the website of La Vanguardia, this will be news. But La Vanguardia has a part that is about sport. Is that still news or is the sport part not something you want to include in the news? So you need to make this kind of decisions. You need to decide also what is being exposed. So if I want to measure exposure, what does that mean? If people go in the website and stay for two seconds, do you count this time or do you say, no, they didn't have time to read anything, so it's not exposure. So you need to take all these decisions to know how to extract the information to compute. And you need to take one that is really, really important. How many days of tracking are you going to use to measure your concept of interest. In surveys, we have an easy solution, which is put the burden on the respondent and ask them to estimate for you on an average day, what are you doing? And their problem, they can think about what they want and we don't know, seems we don't want to know because that's easier for us. But if you use metadata, it's impossible to put the burden on the respondent. You will have the data, you will have to decide. And of course, if you are a feedback company like NetQuest, you could try it because you have the data all the time. But if you are a researcher, you have to buy the data from them. And if you buy one week of data or two weeks of data, the price will be at least twice as much. So you really need to know what you need because you will not want to buy one year of data that would be super expensive if you can do as well with just two weeks of data. No? So that's the kind of decisions and balance with budgets that you will have to do no, at the end. So what we tried is to um, make a list of different things that uh, you have to decide and we propose different choices for each of them and we combined all that and at the end we could create more than 1,000 measures for the same concept, online news media exposure. So if you combine the kind of list that you have about what are the news websites in a country and how many of them you use and which kind of information from this website you take, etc., etc., more than 8,000 ways of creating the measure for the same concept. And then what we did is try to see from these measures if we had what is called convergent and predictive validity. In terms of convergent validity, the idea is to look how these 8,000 measures correlate with each other. And the idea is that if the correlation is high, it means they really measure the same concept. If the correlation is low, they are not really measuring the same concept, all of them. And what we find is actually average to low convergent validity. So not all the measures that we could create really measure the, co the same concept. Huh? And then in terms of predictive validity, what we did is uh, to, to use the literature that is existing that say that uh, political knowledge should be correlated highly with uh, the time people spend on the news. And so we look at this correlation for the different variables that we created. And what we find is that there are high fluctuations really in the predictive validity. So depending how you really operationalize your measure, you get different explanations then for political knowledge, different effects. No? So the summarizing, it's really important to know how you will operationalize your concept also for metadata. No? So if we try to sum up in terms of at the end disadvantage and benefits that we can observe with the metadata, uh, we can see that more or less this is the one that I explained before, but at some of them I put interrogation mark because it's not that clear that actually they are happening. And the three that I put in red are the ones that I think were really problematic so far in the research we did. So dependence on private companies is really a problem. It's really hard to know how they do the things and make them do it properly. New types of errors, there are really many of them and they are clearly problematic as well. And on the other end, reducing some measure materials that existed with surveys due to recall and so on, it's also clear that this is happening. 
but what is not clear is how that relates with the new types of errors and if at the end we really improve or we just create a measure that is as biased but in another direction. So I'm almost uh, full in time, so I will be very quick for the conclusions. I think the main conclusion is that we still have a lot <laughs> to do in that direction. We need more research about the errors, the size of the errors, how we can combine the different uh, methods that we have, etc. And we need more research both in methodology and more applications to really see also for relevant issues in terms of substantive research, how things are changing if we use this kind of data. But uh, I think it's also very important to remember that there will always be errors. So the fact that we have new types of errors for these new types of data should not be a reason to stop doing such research because uh, I don't know if some of you have children and they ever try to take the temperature of the children. But when I got my first son and started doing that, I realized that any measurement has errors, even things that should be easy to measure, like the temperature of someone, and now I was actually trying to measure the length also of the baby and that's also very difficult to be precise. So at the end, I think there will be errors, that's for sure. And there are errors already in things that should be very objective. So when we think about things that are in the mind of respondents, like the trust they have or the support for democracy they may have, etc., I think it's clear that it's not realistic to aim for perfect measure. No? So we should be aware that there will be errors in our data. And what we should do is try to first acknowledge them and try to think about the consequences. So try to do robustness check to see how the results will change if the errors is also changing or if the decisions that we take are also changing. And finally, I think that that's because there are always errors, it's really important to always look from different perspectives because it provides complementary information. So I will finish with this little story of the blind men and the elephants that you might know. So these are different blind men that are asked what an elephant look like. Each of them go to the elephant and touch a different part. And by the part they touch, they deduce what the elephant look like. And they all provide different answers because they are all touching a different part. So at the end, they are all partly in the right for the part they touch, but wrong because they don't get a full picture. And I think that's the same with all the different types of data that we try to use nowadays. If you use only conventional survey or only metadata, you will get only part of the picture. But if you look from different perspective and you combine the different types of data that exist, you may try to get something that is more like really the reality of the concept you are interested in. Okay, thank you very much.